I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Producer's Perspective podcast. I'm Ken Davenport. I've missed you guys. This is episode number 13, lucky number 13 of the podcast. And I just want to say first, thanks to all of you for tuning in. My lovely and capable assistant, Dylan, brings me reports uh, every week on how many of you are downloading and subscribing. It's just awesome. It's a true testament to how many people out there that are, re uh, are really interested in the business of Broadway. It's a lot more than we all think, so thank you. Uh, and now on to today's guest. Look, I often talk about the Broadway season like a horse race. Race starts out in the summer, producers pick a couple of horses to back, and then as the spring rolls around, it's like the horse is coming around the bend for the final furlong. Now, we are in that spring right now. The handicappers are already out with lots of predictions. Uh, and it's quite a feat to have one horse in this race as a lead producer. And the guy sitting across from me right now has not won but two horses in the race this year. And they're big ones. I'm sitting here with producer Tom Curdehy, uh, the lead producer of both It's Only a Play and The Visit. Welcome, Tom. Hello, Ken. Tom has a whole host of producing credits, including last year's Mothers and Sons, The Revival of Ragtime, and more. Uh, and full disclosure, I've been lucky enough to be Tom's partner over the past year on It's Only a Play, and it was watching his incredible work on that show that made me raise my hand and say, I want to be on the visit with you. Wherever you go, Tom, I'm following. So that's why I wanted him to be here today. Now, this is the part of the podcast where I talk about his path to producing, but it's such a fascinating one to me that I'm going to let him do that. So, Tom, tell us a little bit how you got to where you were today. Sure. Um, I, uh, I have always loved the theater. Uh, one of the first shows I ever saw was Chicago with Cheetah Rivera and Gwen Verdon, uh, a Cantor and Ed musical, as you know. So uh, to be doing the visit right now is a particular thrill for me. But um, I grew up across the street from Donna Murphy, and we used to put shows on in our backyard. So uh, we grew up on Long Island, not far from Broadway, and would take the train in to see shows all the time. I had a great theater teacher in high school named Norm Golden, and um, I was very active in the student government. Uh, so I, um, I had two passions, politics and theater. I went to college at NYU and studied dramatic literature, and I thought that I would be a theater lawyer. Uh, I went to law school from 1985 to 1988 at NYU, and at that time um, uh, I came out of the closet and my friends were dying uh, from AIDS. So my dreams um, of being in the theater very quickly switched to um, just wanting to help my community. So I, rather than going into entertainment law, I suddenly found myself full-time providing free legal services to people living with HIV and AIDS. So um, it, what I'm living right now is a dream deferred. For almost 20 years, I worked providing free legal services to people living with HIV and AIDS. I, the passion for the theater never went away. Uh, you're an NYU graduate as well, and you know um, going to NYU, is, you're surrounded by great artists, you know, people who are just beginning their careers, and, and I stayed close with a lot of my friends from school, so I've always known a lot of actors, directors, playwrights. Um, at some point in time, I... Uh, actually, I should backtrack a little. Um, I moved out to, from the city to Long Island and uh, began an HIV project out there. I quickly became the chair of a group called the East End Gay Organization, which um, is a political cultural group out on the East End of Long Island. And along with um, a, a critic uh, named Isa Goldberg, I produced uh, an afternoon conversation called Theater from a Gay Perspective, and I had three people on that panel, uh, Edward Albee, Lanford Wilson, and Terrence McNally. Uh, Terrence and I met, we fell in love, we uh, began a relationship, and that relationship stoked the, the flames of my old uh, desire to 
want to work in the theater. Um, it was important to me that I not lose my identity when we became a couple, so I continued lawyering for probably about five years. But over time, um, as I spent uh, time, uh, more time in and around the theater community, I decided I really wanted to return to that original dream. So I met with producers all over the city, and I just said, I will bring you coffee. I will lick stamps for you. I will do anything if you just let me in the room, let me listen and learn. And a lot of them were very kind to me, and they said, you know, yes, I'll let you bring me coffee, but I also want, I want to hear your opinions. And you can read, you're a lawyer, you can read contracts, you can, you can give me all the free help you want, and, but, it's, but you will be quiet and you will sit in a corner. And, and that was a great gift. And so for a, a time I did that and, um, and finally said, all right, I'm done with the lawyering and now I want, I want to do this, I want to produce. And so slowly over the last six or seven years, I accumulated some credits, and um, and this year has has been a particularly good one. So, so for someone who considered law school many times throughout my career, whenever I had a bad day, I think in my early, I was like, maybe I should just go to law school. And my mother was like, yes, Ken, you should go to law school. So tell me a little bit about about doing that and how how that prepped you for a career in the theater. Obviously, the contract part is easy, right? Right. But what else about the the legal education prepped you for what you're doing now? Well, I think um, I think it has really helped my dramaturgical gifts. I think that I know how to think very logically and very clearly, and I think a lot of artists are not good self-advocates, so I think I know how to help artists get from point A to point B, and... Um, provide them a means of having their voices heard, which is something I was able to do in a courtroom, but also help them with a, a, a clarity of thought so that um, if in terms of their storytelling or drama, they're trying to achieve something dramaturgically, but they're a little stuck because uh, most creative people I know so much is going on in their minds, and they just need someone to help them uh, sort of get through the clutter and achieve their desired end. I think that um, as someone who was an advocate, that was a lesson that I learned, and that's a that's a skill set I bring to this to my job as a producer. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. Listen, I not everyone who's listening has watched you be an advocate like I have personally, but that's exactly what I've seen you do. And I've never thought about the legal aspect being a very dramaturgical mm -hmm. education, but it certainly is. Now, you talked about being around some producers early on and licking stamps. Were there any that provided real mentor-like guidance yeah, for you? The first person was a woman named Susie Dietz. Uh, I approached her very gingerly and uh, in a frightened way. And she just threw up her hands and said, of course, come on in. And, uh, and she was great to me. Um, Manny Eisenberg, uh, Kevin McCollum, Scott Rudin, Stuart Thompson, uh, all of these people were, Liz McCann, all of these people, very, Hal Prince, I'm sorry, <laughs> all of these people, uh, Never heard of any of those people. Generously said, uh, and 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 were very clear they weren't going to do me. It was uh, they were not going to tolerate a diva, and I was not going to be uh, treated in any special way because I was uh, the partner of a playwright. It, it was literally, you will bring me Starbucks, you will you will do all those things, and then you'll have to earn your way through to the next steps, and and. That was good for me uh, because I think that's it's a tough business, as you know. And um, sooner or later, all of the contacts in the world go away, and it's just you and your responsibilities, and only you can achieve them. And um, so I, I was fortunate that a lot of people were willing to give back or at least uh, give me enough space that I could... Uh, I'm a sponge. I really... I love being around very smart people.
people. I, I say to all of my interns and my staff and all of the people in my life, surround yourself by, around people who are smarter than you. Because if you become the smartest person in the room, you're not likely to learn anything. And uh, so I, I, uh, I try to, um, you know, I've loved working with you because I, I always know that some crazy idea is going to come out of your mouth and it's going to lead to a great solution that no one has ever thought of. I mean, you're just an endless source of invention and innovation and you love to push boundaries and uh, be a voice for the future. And I think that that is uh, a particular gift that you have. And uh, um, I think the minute we get a little too comfortable, stasis sets in and I, 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 I don't want to go to that place. I don't want to live in a too comfortable a place. Well, thank you for that. And you gave some great advice there because I, I, I so agree, and I tell this to young people all the time, a contact can get you in the door to a room. It can't keep you in that room no, at can't. all. Nor should it. No, not at all. Uh, so what a modern-day producer, what do you think the greatest skills are that they should have? Mm. If you could design one, build a producer doll with certain skill set, what do you think those skills would be? Uh, I think the, the greatest skill of all is, uh, are, is, or the skill of communication. And I think that you have to communicate with your investors. You have to communicate with your, the team that surrounds you, your ad agency, your press people, your artists. And unless you're willing to do that and have those abilities, I think you've got a problem and maybe you're in the wrong profession. And so there is a lot of multitask that goes on. And I also think it's recognizing your own weaknesses. I'm, I, I love budgets and I love numbers, but I'm not fast with them. And so I, I like surrounding myself by people who are really facile with numbers and, and really understand the concept of dynamic ticket pricing and, and, how flexible we have to be in this business. If you're rigid, uh, I don't think you're going to get very far. Uh, so one of the things I've, I've said to everyone I know when they say, oh, what's it like working with Tom? I say, Tom, I've never seen anyone work with stars as well as you do. Mm -hmm. And look, It's Only a Play has more stars per square inch than, <laughs> than any show that I've been a part of, certainly, if not been on Broadway. How how do you deal with it? Obviously, these folks are larger. Dealing with one is a lot. Mm -hmm. on, on, it's only a play. It was seven. Uh, and everyone speaks so highly of you, all of them. Everyone loves it. What's it like dealing with those kind of people on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, um, I, I love artists. And I think that every star that I've ever worked with recognizes that. I think um, I... If if we strip stars of their humanity, we are not being fair to them. And we have to remember that they are, although we deify them, they are still very much human beings. And I think that remembering their status and honoring that while um, treating them like human beings with feelings and fears and emotions and passions and hopes and insecurities is key. And um, I'm, I'm one of seven kids. I grew up in a big Irish Catholic family. And I think that, uh, and I was sort of Switzerland in my family. I was the neutral. I got along with everybody. And I think that um, uh, understanding quirks of personality is... Uh, invaluable in this business. and But I, I think the, the most important thing is I truly love artists. And I think so far people have recognized that. And you can't you can't fake it as well as as well as it comes off with right. you. It's yeah. every time I hear you talk about them or hear them talk about you, it's so genuine. Uh, and again, as I've said to you, and I'll say publicly, how you've managed to keep all those stars and replacements all working together. And now, of course, with Cheetah and and Roger, it's it's amazing. So let's talk about stars, though, a little bit. And 
their necessity on Broadway, mm -hmm. if you will. Do you think the visit would be happening if it wasn't for Cheetah Rivera? Do you think that it could, could the visit exist on Broadway these days without the legend that it has in it? Um, that's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. I think probably someday it might, but my visit wouldn't exist without Cheetah Rivera. Um, I, someone asked me recently, uh, you know, let's face it, uh, it's wonderful that you, you've been so passionate about this project, but isn't it great for Terrence? And the truth is, that had never, ever, ever occurred to me. As I've uh, pushed to bring the visit to Broadway, it has always been Cheetah, Cheetah, Cheetah. It never even occurred to me that my husband wrote the book. And, I, and that's the God's honest truth. It just... In my mind, I was doing this because that woman that I saw in Chicago when I was 12 years old needed to be seen giving one of the greatest performances I've ever seen in my life. And that is not hyperbola. I'm not worried that uh, it's overstatement. I'm not nervous that people are going to go into the theater and say, what was that guy talking about? This performance will be talked about for decades to come. That's, 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 again, that's not speculation. That's a statement of fact. And so uh, this visit would not happen without Cheetah Rivera. And I think all of you can get an idea of the type of passion that we're dealing with when Tom speaks about a show. <laughs> I'm producing the show. I'm, I'm going to buy tickets right now. Uh, but let's talk about that because mm. your passion for this project obviously is amazing. This piece has been in development on its way to Broadway for a decade or so yeah, yeah, and has stalled that. many times. Right. And yet here you come, pick it up, and all of a sudden it's here. So tell me a little bit about the, the later part of the path and, and when you said, I'm, I'm going to be the one to do this, and then you got it done. Well, it's, it's here because we finally, I think, got it right. I mean, the, the visit has always been... Uh, a good musical. The raw materials have always been wonderful, but it needed um, a specific vision. It needed uh, a strong dramaturgical hand, and it needed um, a shape that it hadn't previously had. It also needed sex, and Roger Reese brought that to the t brings that to the table. I mean it. Uh, Roger and Cheetah together create so much chemistry, it's, it's really quite thrilling. But um, the smartest thing I've ever done as a producer, I think, is uh, stop John Doyle on an airplane and said, will you read this? Will you just take a look at this? Because even though it's been around a long time, I haven't. I wouldn't have brought it to Broadway if I didn't feel it was ready. I mean, it's not like, oh, I'm. I have this property and I need to get it on Broadway because I got nothing else going on. It was really about. We finally found the essential, the missing ingredient, which was a uh, director with a very clear notion of what had to happen to make to let the visit flourish in its best possible light. And um, he, he's the guy who cracked it, not me. I'm just the lucky person who thought of him. Did you know John before you saw him on that airplane? I had met him a number of times, but did I... You know, I didn't have his phone number, for instance. I, uh, I, he, I had... Um, when he did Sweeney Todd and first came to New York... He and his husband uh, came to my home, actually, and we just, we just, I think we, we got a, a random message to him saying, it's brilliant, it's such beautiful work. And so we had a friendly exchange, and he came over, and we all had a drink together. But it was just sort of congratulations, you know, there was no deep relationship. And then he had directed an evening uh, as a tribute to uh, Terrence. And so I got to know him casually, but we had never had a meal together or anything like that. But I, I, and, but I absolutely 
for years had believed that he was the right guy for this project. And I literally was walking around with the script in my bag thinking, you know, I, I don't know why, uh, but when I saw him on the plane, I'm not one to let opportunities pass me by. So I, I pounced. I basically stalked the guy, you know. So I wanted you to tell a little bit more of that story because for me, that is the definition of what great producers mm -hmm. do. Both parts of it. I carry around the script in my bag, which right. means you're always available for the opportunity. Right, right. And you when know. the opportunity presents itself, you recognize it and pounce on it. Right. Um, which is great. I mean, you that one moment of you approaching him on the airplane changed theater history. This thing is happening now. I think now. so. I, yeah, yeah. No, and uh, um, I, I, what's the, there's a, uh, there's a line and it's only a play. All is in readiness. And I... I think that uh, the best producers, or especially emerging producers who don't have the luxury of relationships, have to be ready at all times to take some risks and to go up to that person or make that phone call or send that email and just seize, seize opportunities, seize the day, you know. And uh, it's sort of like a, a, a Hollywood story. I mean, you just... You can't make it up. But I didn't hesitate. I didn't. I didn't say, "Oh, I should leave him alone," or, you know, maybe when he gets off, I pounced, and um, and it has sort of changed history. Uh, and you know, tonight's our first preview, and he sent me the most beautiful email this morning, saying, "You know, tonight for the first time, the visit will be seen on Broadway." And that's that's a Cantor and Ebb musical. You know, that's crazy. That's I'm a little kid from suburban Long Island. And I, I, I'm, I pinch myself. I, you know. Well, it's happening because of you, so you should be very, very proud of that. And your note about emerging producers being ready to pounce. Listen, it's not only emerging. You and I know, and I won't say who it is, but I'm, I'm going to pounce on someone tonight mm -hmm. because there's an idea that uh, that I want, and I'm going right, to. Right. I know this person is going to be in the audience if it's only a play, and I've got to summon up the courage, and it's not easy for me either. I mean, I've got to do it and uh, because I want something done. But you've got to do it. Yeah. You've got to do it. And yeah. if you have information like that, you can't not seize the day. You know, it's, uh, yeah. It's... Now, you're very active in the Broadway League's Government Relations Committee. Correct. They were not idiots when they said, let's get, <laughs> let's get a lawyer and someone right. who is a major advocate uh, for other organizations to be our advocate. So tell me a little bit about what the Government Relations Committee is up to right now. Okay, so uh, on a federal level, we are lobbying for legislation that would provide certain tax credits to people who invest in live theater. And the, uh, in a nutshell, what we are asking Congress to do is to give us parity with film and television. Uh, People who invest in productions of up to $15 million can write off their investments immediately. People who invest in theater do not have that luxury. We are not given the same credit that people who invest in film are. So if you or I are in L.A. and we are courting investors who have invested in films before and we start our pitches, they're likely to ask about tax consequences and what they can write off because it's part of people's business plans. To get people who invest in film to understand that their investments will be treated differently is so difficult. It takes such a leap of comprehension that they shouldn't have to take because they're used to something very different. People who invest in theater are not afforded that same luxury. So it's a disincentive. And I, all we are trying to do is say, treat us the same. And the government doesn't lose anything as a result. It's just it's when people are taxed and how they're taxed is different. But it's cost-free. I, I honestly think it's just that the film and television lobby was stronger and more organized when the legislation was passed. And we're just playing catch up at this point. Do you think we'll be successful? I do. I think um, I think we've had the task of educating people because Congress is always afraid of anything that's going to cost them money or reduce income streams to the federal government. And uh, so we've had the 
challenge of explaining that this is, there's no outlay here and that ultimately this is, uh, and this provides stimulation to the economy. It gives people incentive to invest. And, 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 and also the, uh, part of our education has been, has been to, Paul Levin always says Broadway is the longest street in America. And when people hear live theater, they assume that we're only talking about Broadway. But these tax incentives are, exist in all 50 states and, and will help theaters all across the country. So we've had to do a fair amount of educating, and now it's um, Senator Schumer is going to be one of the co-sponsors of the legislation in the Senate. We have uh, a myriad co-sponsors on both sides of the aisle in both the Senate and the Congress. So I think that we're well poised to get it passed. I think we've done the educating, and now we just have to do the execution. So, listeners, write to your Congress people about this. We want this one to pass. Right. Uh, that's obviously a very busy time for you. Nathan's coming back to It's Only a Play next week. And as you said, the first preview of the visit is tonight. Yep. Are you nervous? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was the quickest answer you've given so far. Yeah. Yeah. Very nervous. Uh, I'm more excited. I, you know, it's so, it's, we did it, we did a dress rehearsal last night. It was really thrilling. Um, I'm not, I'm not nervous about what's going to happen on that stage. I just have the sort of butterflies that come with the job because it's the first time we're going to be in front of a, a paying audience and we have a packed house and I just, uh, I, I want the actors to have a great night and, uh, I, I'm very confident that the audience will have a great time but I want the actors to just relax and, and be able to enjoy the evening. And I'll be happy when it's over. But, but uh, I, I, last night I said to uh, John Doyle and to Cheetah and to Roger Reese, and actually to John Kander as well, and I can't believe I know these people, uh, just we are giving the world what we set out to give them. And there were no, uh, and so we're feeling a sense of uh, eagerness as much as, uh, it's not fear, it's just nerves. And uh, during the preview period, there's obviously lots of chatter in the business mm -hmm. and lots of people talking and changes going on. Uh, we've talked about this before, but mm -hmm. do you, how do you, do you block out the chatter that people are saying, industry people, chat rooms, what how do you deal with this as a producer? Do you uh, go into the chat rooms? Uh, I used to, uh, and uh, I don't anymore. I've never, uh, I don't, I don't post in the chat rooms. I never did, but I, uh, I used to spend a, way too much time in them, and uh, they would hijack my days because I'd be more interested in what other people are saying than in doing my own work. And that I, I realized that was not constructive or healthy for me. I think it's a great place for people to get their opinions out or whatever agendas they have. Uh, I do have, I think it's important that uh, as producers we know what people are saying and, and what the general temperature is around our shows. So I have staff and interns who tell me what's going on, but um, for me, the best thing that I can do is not spend time in them because I do think there's too much toxic uh, behavior going on inside them. I, I don't. I feel like uh, the general culture inside those rooms uh, has turned very negative, and um, I'm more interested. I, I I feel like as a community we we could do a little better and. Uh, you know, I think the anonymous nature of chat rooms is such that it it allows people to say whatever they want without accountability. And um, and for me, uh, I just found that that was not a healthy place for me to be spending my time. So I I I. But I'm not above asking what's what are they saying? Uh, you know, please, I'm not above that. But. I don't spend time in them. Where do you get feedback during previews? You just listen to the audience, the actors? I'm the all-time great eavesdropper. I, I generally don't wear a suit when I go to the theater. I try to be as anonymous as possible. I try not to be seen by, uh, 
by audience members talking to artists or tech people so that nobody knows that I have a position of authority because I want I want authentic responses. So the men's room is a great place to hear chatter or the online at the bar. You know, I, I um, in our ad and press meetings, I get feedback from people. And again, uh, you know, I have uh, some staff members who do spend time in the chat rooms and they tell me the gist of things that are going on. So, But when people say unkind things about my friends, whatever show they're on, I just get too upset. I just, it bothers me. I, and I, I don't want to hear that. That is your, the love of the artist again. And speaking of that, you've, you've worked with the love of your life on shows and on, you've worked without him on other shows. What's it like working with the, the players and maintaining your objectivity as a producer at the same time you know, being a partner? Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. I think we've gotten really good at it. Uh, and I don't know when that happened, but it did. I think the one thing that Terrence and I know about each other is that we love each other. And so it's pretty safe. If I say something brutal about the writing, and I've been known to do that uh, with a red pen, uh, <laughs> uh, it can wound, but he knows it comes from a place of love. So there is trust. Uh, and... If he has things to say about management, meaning you and me, um, he doesn't hesitate, but I know, I trust that he really cares about the show and the, and the, the health and welfare of the production. So I give it its place. We do have rules in the house, like we, we don't talk about it in bed, definitely not after 11 o'clock. Uh, and, um, and even um, we send social messages if we if we're in a rehearsal room or even a meeting we don't sit next to one another we don't there are no public displays of affection people need people on my productions need to feel safe saying this book scene needs work or Terrence is making the actors nervous can you you, you know they they have to be able to comment on the work otherwise. Um, I'm not getting the information that I need out of people. And, you know, I said earlier, it's important to spend, surround yourself by people who are smarter than you. That, that extends to people who can be honest. And I, if, if we create an environment where people can't be honest, the work won't get done. And I, I genuinely believe anyone who has worked with us will vouch for the truth of what I'm saying, I, you know, a hundred percent. I've, I've had a few relationships on with, uh, people in shows of mine and I, it's very hard and you guys do it unbelievably well. I, I'm shocked how objective you could be and how tough you could be yeah. uh, on him. It's really, it's really wonderful. Okay. One last question, which one of my readers has now deemed the genie question, which okay. is, I want you to imagine the genie from Aladdin came down, <laughs> did a big song and dance number and said, I'm going to give you one wish, not three, because Scott Rudin took the other two. So he, he's going to give you one wish. He's going to say, if you could change one thing about Broadway, just one thing that drives you crazy, keeps you up at night, frustrates you, makes you want to jump up and down, what would that one thing be that with the snap of a finger and a wave of his wand, he could make go away? Mm -hmm. Make go away or make happen? Make happen whatever you want. The one okay. thing that you'd love to see change on Broadway. I think... I, I, I often uh, say that to outsiders or to emerging producers, it feels like the lifeboats are full and it's very hard to get on onto one of them. If you're a new producer, if you, um, and I wish we had another lifeboat so that a group of emerging producers could get on and flourish. And I think that we can be better at allowing, uh, producers who have not had an opportunity to lead, be lead producers I think that we can be better at um, giving them a safe uh, voyage and giving them theaters and, and supporting them financially and uh, 
just making a little more room for the next generation. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. And it makes sense with the theme of this whole podcast, which is, Tom, you are an incredible advocate for at the beginning of your career for people living with HIV to artists to producers now. And I can't thank you enough for being a part of this and for being a great partner to me on my shows. Good luck to both of us tonight on The Visit. Everyone out (laughs) there, go see it. And thank you for tuning in. We will see you next time. Thanks, Ken.